been here uh, for a while today, but uh, hey, glad to see you and uh, keep encouraging others. I think if this COVID will back off a little bit, some of the others are going to begin to feel a little bit better. I tell them I think it's one of the safer places to be because there's plenty of room to spread out and uh, social distance as much as you would desire. Let's pray as we get started today. Lord, what a privilege it is to be able to come before uh, your throne of grace, God, to be able to approach you with our worship, and also, Lord, to be able to do that with the friends and the family that we love. God, I pray that you'll bless us. Thank you for Taylor, who leads us in Mike's absence today. And Lord, I pray that uh, you'll be exalted in everything we say, do, and sing. So we praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I want to invite you to remain seated uh, as we sing some songs this morning. We're going to start with The Lily of the Valley. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Up ten thousand to my soul. He all my grief has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation, he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn from my heart, and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me. While I lean by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I'm nothing now to fear. With his manna, he my hungry soul shall fill. And sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Thank you. We're going to continue with You're My All in All. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, or to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus. Sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Thank 
you. We are going to um, do a couple of scripture readings now. If you will stand, we're going to uh, read the verses from Psalm 33:12 and Proverbs 14:34. We'll start with Psalm. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen to be his own possession. And then Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Thank you. We'll now sing, My Country, Tis of Thee. <clears throat> Let's do one more. Last verse. Our fathers God to the author of liberty. side we've got the new prayer ministry newsletter and I just want to explain for a second about that each issue has a different teaching about prayer along with the various items we ask you to pray about so it's both educational as well as a prayer list okay we do hope that you'll be using that guys let's pray father we come to you in the name of Jesus Lord we thank you for the opportunity to be here Father, we do thank you for our country and the freedom we have to worship. We know, Lord, nobody's trying to burn our church down or burn our houses down or waylay us on the road just because we're Christians, and we thank you for that. We do pray for our brothers and sisters around the world today that are living in places that don't have the freedoms that we have. We pray that you will give them strength, courage, give them the grace to stand the times. Father, for those here in our church who are suffering, who are sick, uh, the Miles family and others, Father, we just pray that uh, you would meet their every need. Father, thank you for loving us. And may this service glorify you in every way, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that had thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee. Of God I come, I 
come just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood can each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God. Just as I am. Just as I am, I would be lost. But mercy and grace, my freedom. Thank you, Taylor. Always blessed by his music, but also that's not taking away from Mike Carter. Appreciate Mike and all that he does as well uh, for the church and the ministry. Take your Bibles, turn with me if you would to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. As you're turning there, let me remind you that this is the third Sunday in a row that I'm going to have spoken from this passage, not this verse, but this passage, okay, these are the latter verses. Matter of fact, the last verses of chapter 8. And uh, as we look at them, uh, they might be the hardest verses of the chapter as well. I simply, over the last couple of days, would uh, give it a title. And that title of the particular uh, theme or the work that God shows me in these verses is my story. Most of you probably are not really interested in my story. However, I think uh, as believers, Romans chapter 8 could tell us all of our story, okay? For it begins in verse 1, talking about peace we have with God, and then the end verse, uh, 28, 
would tell us that all things uh, have worked together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. So if you see what I see there, from the time that we obtain that peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ till the time of our departure, what we discover is my story or your story. Now, from the word uh, that we see, history or his uh, story, we're always reading something uh, concerning that, are we not? We're reading about somebody or from somebody. And as a result, uh, as a result of that, uh, over even the celebration of yesterday and the holiday weekend, we have American history or his story from the view of someone else. So, as I read these verses to you today, and as we try to expound upon them or explain them uh, in a uh, translation, hopefully, that we can each uh, understand, and that would be our own words. Now, my words are not easily followed, but I trust you'll put your words in place of mine here today, okay? Likewise, uh, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose." Sometimes we get to the end of life or even the afterlife as some would write it and they might begin to talk or continue to talk about your story. Uh, it is not uh, uncommon for somebody to want to talk about uh, my parents or maybe my grandparents and various places uh, that I go. By the way, some of you might have saw a tag on Facebook that my sister has put there concerning my dad and fighting in the Korean conflict. And by nature of the Awana ministry, they've met many people from South Korea. And uh, they were asking one day, do you know anybody who fought in the Korean conflict? And well, naturally my sister said my dad did. And he said, well, if you'll get me some proof, the Korean government or, or South Korean government is recognizing men and women alike who fought in the Korean conflict. And uh, by that, what we find now currently is they had just received a plaque and a, uh, a particular model of some sort. So, you know what? History is continuing to be written. His story, I call it. But I want to talk to you about my story for a moment. There's a song that we sing, and uh, the chorus of that song says, This is my story. This is my song. And it goes on to say, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Now, in the morning service, I had not done my history lesson, uh, but I made reference to this song, okay? And I said uh, that this particular song or poem was written by Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby said, My friend, Miserous Knapp, composed a melody, played it over and over to me two or three times on the piano. Now, this is the origin of that song. Mrs. Knapp, uh, who was a musician, was just playing a uh, melody one day, and Fanny Crosby was in her presence and uh, said, Miss Knapp played it two or three times. But the story said, she then asked me, what it said, and I immediately replied, Blessed Assurance. And within a few minutes, Fanny Crosby had written the complete poem, Just As It Stands Today, and the song was first published in 1873. Now, the part of that history lesson I didn't uh, share with the first uh, group this morning at 8.30 is this, that Mrs. Knapp was originally named Phoebe Palmer, born in New York City on March 8 of 1930, or 1839. Her father was a Methodist evangelist, Dr. Walter Palmer. She obtained wide uh, 
uh, spread reputation as a writer of music and verse, specializing in children's writing. At the age of 16, she married Joseph Knapp, a prominent Sunday school worker. That was in the movement of Sunday schools back in the 1800s. Uh, long story has it that Miss Knapp died, or when Mr. Knapp died, he left his wife an income of $50,000 a year, the most of which she spent for religious and charitable activities. And uh, it goes on to tell about the pipe organ she had in her home, the largest instrument ever installed in a personal home or a private home. She published more than 500 of her own gospel compositions. And the story tells us that this is the only one of her compositions uh, that has been maintained or survived. Now, that is Mrs. Knapp's story. That's her story, okay? Of all 500 hymns that she would sit down and begin to play, and later somebody would put words to, uh, Blessed Assurance is the only one. Now, the other part of the history is we were reminded this morning that Fanny Crosby wrote over a thousand hymns. And uh, by the way, if you would take up a hymnal sometime at your leisure, what you would find is there are many, many of Fanny Crosby's hymns uh, that are continuing to be sung. Now, I get back to the closing or to the chorus of that song. This is my story. This is my song. And what I discovered in Romans chapter 8 is my story, okay? And my story begins with the privilege uh, to suffer and reign with Christ. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 talks about that. For it says, I, or, or 8, 1, let me just quote that to you and then I'll read to you. Verse number 18, there is there no, no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you're a believer this morning, let me tell you where your story started, okay? It started at the same place mine did. And our life in Christ begins at the moment we believe by faith. And at that moment, the Scripture says, uh, there is now therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk according to the, fle uh, who walk according to the Spirit, not of the flesh. Now let me just remind you, church, uh, all of our story begins there. Let me tell you the significant part of our story. Yes, we know our other parts of the story. We want to talk about our birth and our childhood, and those are wonderful. Hey, that makes some good fodder when the siblings get around, doesn't it? How sometimes we can just embellish those moments, and we can, we can make our story sound like we want it to. You know, about walking to school uphill uh, both ways, you know, two times a day in the snow, and all oh, our kids and grandkids, they begin to lap it up. But hey, listen, my story really began with Jesus. And when I saw that in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, I thought about this that I penned for you, the privilege to suffer and reign with Christ. Yes, we are not victims today. Will you understand? It seems like that. What I read sometimes uh, from the pen or pencil or what I read sometimes from the keyboard of what someone is writing would make us believe uh, that we're on the down and out and would make me believe that your story is already sealed there. And, and as a result of that, you have no hope. But let me tell you, we really do have hope today. Why? Because we are in Christ Jesus. Not only do I look at that part about reigning with Christ, we talked last week about that privilege to suffer with Christ when he said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us in Christ Jesus. We talked about physical suffering. We talked about emotional suffering. We talked about possible financial suffering. There's all types of suffering, friend. And let me tell you, I have not even began to touch the surface in my simple life on suffering. Brother Clint makes mention quite often in prayers about someone in a foreign country or in another country. But I also remind you that there's somebody in this country today who is suffering for Christ's sake. 
Now the reality of that is, the more we're willing to stand for Christ, the more we're going to be criticized for the stand that we take. Don't let that bother you. Why? Because the best is yet to come. Amen? Hey, it's going to get better. You say, well, hey, preacher, is it going to get better in this life? I won't make you that promise. But I promise you that what we're going through is nothing to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us in Christ Jesus. Why is that so? Well, consider Jesus. The writer of the Hebrew letter would say in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, Consider Him, and once you and I consider His life and His suffering, what we will conclude there real quickly is uh, that that uh, is nothing compared to the glory that is revealed there. So I move from that privilege to suffer and reign with Christ. I want you to see where we really going to spend a moment here, and that is the privilege to pray and petition our Lord. Now, remember the I knows in this passage, okay? Uh, we find the first one there in verse 18. For we know that uh, again... The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. Then we find one of them here. Notice it says in verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know. Now, you're looking at the slide there, the PowerPoint slide, uh, and I underlined it for you, for we know not. Uh, And that is, we know not what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. How many of you would just go ahead and admit with me today that sometimes we're called to pray for somebody or called to pray with somebody, and the reality of it is we don't know what to pray for. Friend, I am called to, I'm called to that position a lot. And you say, well, preacher, uh, if you don't know what to pray for, who does? The Spirit does. Seriously, it would be well for us to be reminded today in our walk with the Lord, in our talk with the Lord, that there's the reality of just simply not knowing what to ask Him for. Now, I remind you today, when I don't know what to ask for, the best thing to do is just ask for the best, isn't it? And the best to me is described in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 that our Lord is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we think or ask. So if you and I think we're big thinkers, just remember, He's a bigger doer. Have you ever been guilty of asking God for way too little? Have you ever been guilty of trusting Him for not enough? Well, probably we all have, in the sense there that we didn't really know what to ask for. Now, the privilege to pray and petition our Lord. Uh, Let's stop there for just a moment. Uh, Brother Clint introduced that green paper to you, the July edition of the prayer sheet, okay? It's not a prayer list. He reminded you about that. There are some names on there. I actually viewed that copy when I came through the office area Thursday, I believe it was. And then I picked one up again this morning after the first service. And I began to look, and there are a few names down there on the bottom. And matter of fact, uh, uh, they don't just randomly choose those, sort of like I'd send out an email sometimes on a night. I don't randomly choose those, uh, but neither do I try to give an exhaustive long prayer list either. And what happens sometimes is I don't list everybody who needed to be listed because this little old tinker up here just don't tink like it used to think, you know, and I forget. And rather than send out five emails, I save that one for tomorrow evening. And then you know what's happened before tomorrow evening if you're not careful. You forgot what you were thinking about yesterday evening. The Scripture, though, says we know not what to pray as we ought. So I've thought about some prayer things here, and that is why to pray. I remind you that we pray because it's the right thing to do. How many of you do right things? Brush your teeth, take good care of your health, take maintenance medicine, exercise 30 minutes a day. Now I'm meddling, Emma. Well, praying is right there, should be on on the top of our list. Why to pray? Because the Scripture says to, doesn't it? If you study the book of Genesis, a mark in the book of Genesis 
that would follow Abraham almost everywhere he went. You know what he would build? An altar. And you know, as you begin to study that, what you would see is that the prayer life of Abraham was increasingly important. Now, you don't have to go out on your property if you're a landowner. You don't have to build a bunch of altars. Matter of fact, I don't even know that that would be wise. But you need a constant altar, and that is a communion with our Lord. So we could go on and on about why to pray. Uh, we could even ask ourselves how to pray, could we not? Well, the disciples of Jesus asked Him one day to teach them to pray as John taught His disciples. You say, well, how do they know so much about John's disciples? I'm concluding that John the Baptist had a couple of disciples that became disciples of Jesus. Am I right? It says two of his disciples followed him no more after he had saw Jesus come that day. And maybe John's disciples got to telling Jesus' disciples of whom they all were. Maybe they begin to tell him some of the methodology of John. And that's John the Baptist, matter of fact. And they might have said, hey, one day we had a seminar on how to pray. Then those disciples of Jesus would go to Jesus and say, hey, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples. Now, friend, I want to tell you something. That's exciting, isn't it? Many times we don't have anybody come up to us in the course of a week or the course of a year and say, Hey, pastor or Sunday school teacher, hey, friend, would you teach me how to pray? Well, the Scripture doesn't say in this particular passage that we don't know how to pray, do, does it? It says in Romans 8.26 uh, that uh, we don't know what to pray for as we should. So we think sometime and we get focused. Prayer's a good subject. So we write the sermons on how to pray. We write the lesson on why to pray. And you know, we could even, we could even write a paragraph or something on when to pray. Oh, you need to pray every evening before you go to sleep. Well, you go to sleep praying. You feel guilty about that. Hey, I've often said this. That's a good way to go to sleep is pray and wake up. Maybe you're thinking about where you left off. Well, the when to pray. We could go on and on with that. But he didn't say, hey, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities to tell us when to pray. He tells us not where to pray or to whom to pray. And it's all wonderful subject matter, is it not? And by the way, I probably have given Brother Clint a challenge on that. He and Miss Harriet. Uh, and they might even begin to answer some of those questions because I think they are vital. Well, let's get back to the real question, or the real thought there. The Spirit helpeth our infirmities. Why? For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Now, I reminisced over years of ministry. And the years of ministry are some of the opportunities that uh, I've been called to maybe pray for somebody or pray with somebody and Friend, let me, let me just be honest with you. They've been some tough situations, uh, and I don't, I don't want you to draw your attention to me saying that. I'm just wanting to tell you this. I've been called to pray for or to pray with uh, uh, a lot of folks, and the reality is I didn't know what to pray for. Well, preacher, why don't you just ask God to heal her? Why don't you just ask God to raise up that person? Well, hey, it's all right, but uh, I can ask God for that. But I really didn't know that I knew that I had heard from God that that's what I ought to be praying for. So, folks, I want to just be honest with you, and I'm talking about earthly honest with you. Hey, I'm but dust. I'm the one he's talking about in Romans 8, 26. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. You ever feel helpless? You got somebody standing before you that they're desperate? You know, and, and, and as a result of that, uh, you, you know the God of all glory, the creator, the sustainer of life, and, and they're, they're almost like, uh, I'm dependent on you to call on God for us. But yet and still, we know not what to ask for as we ought. Been one of those weeks, you know, with a family, and you know, this change and that change. And boy, they've been through—they've been through a tough week, 
Matter of fact, two weeks. But thinking about this passage, knowing that we were in a sequence there and fixing to preach it or study it, and just a couple of experiences this week just made me know, hey, preacher, you, you don't even know what to ask God for. And you know that's the truth. Let me give you a couple of three things that make me know or help me to know why that happens that way. The first reason I might not know what to pray for is my vision is distracted. Now, the word vision is not just what I see, you know. Uh, a vision can be a spiritual type thing. It's a word from God or uh, such to the like. You remember in the proverb, isn't it, where it says, without a vision the people perish. And it talks about without having a word from God on that or a revelation or a uh, rema from that. Well, uh, sometimes I just have to admit to you, my vision gets distracted. Now, to get distracted means you could be sidetracked, diverted, or confused. <laughs> I've had people tell me, man, you stay confused all the time. Well, not all the time, just 99%. Spiritually. Remember, we're living in this world, but we're not to be of this world. Any of you getting consumed with the surrounding circumstances? Boy, it's been a crazy year, hasn't it? Seriously. You know, you're going along, you're floating well down the good, easy stream, and lo and behold, here comes a pandemic. And we never uh, did anything with that word except learn to spell it. Well, maybe we could define it. And then from a pandemic, we go to this, and we go to that, and we go to another. And I don't know about you, but I get distracted. I tell people I'm ADHD and probably another couple of the letters of the alphabet as well. But when I get, when I get distracted, that even confuses me more. Because that's that moment, it's imperative that we call on God and to know what to ask God for. Naturally, if somebody's suffering physically, we want healing for them, do we not? But is that always what God wants? If somebody seems to be dying, well, we'd like God to raise them up, would we not? Hey, that's not bad to ask God for that. But I tell you, many things I've asked God for, I didn't know what to ask for. So I would just ask. Why? Because my vision would get distracted or my view gets distorted. See the digression of this. Not the progression, but the digression. If my vision is distracted, my view gets distorted. Uh, yes, I, I wear bifocals. Yes, I cannot read that up there. Now I can see that, but I can't see you. Now I can do that, and I can't see you, but I can see that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, distraction, and then there's the distortion. To be distorted, something to be biased or inaccurate or one-sided. I don't know, but the truth is this. As I said earlier, we're in this world, but we're not to be of this world. You remember Jesus prayed, Father, don't take them out of this world, but neither let them be a part of the world. As the fellow said the other day, I'm just passing through. But I thought about it this morning. The more I'm passing through, the more I'm realizing that I'm on the uh, slower end of the, I mean, I'm on the quicker end of the journey. Not near as many years left as I used to be. So I can't, I, I can't uh, afford to be distracted or live distracted. I can't uh, live to be distorted. Why? Because it even further uh, disturbs me that I can't pray as I ought when I'm like that. Just the third thing. If my vision is distracted and my view is distorted, my, vi my victory becomes disconnected. You know, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, I asked the group this morning who could quote it. And you know, people don't always raise their hands real fast because they're afraid I'm going to ask, Hey, now, would you say that for me? I'm not going to do that to you. But the Scripture said, But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. Did He give us the victory or are we working on the victory? No, that's something to chew on, is it? Now this evening, just before your nap and right after, start thinking on that. I can conclude this real quickly. Two or three of the reasons I don't know what to pray for as I ought is my vision is what? Distracted and my view is distorted and I've become disconnected from the victory that the Lord Jesus says is mine. Yes, we're in a battle, are we not? And you could name the battle. You could probably say, hey man, we're in a battle for America. And I think we are. Oh, we're in a battle for his soul or her soul. And yes, we are. But it's really not my fight and yours, is it? The Lord Jesus is the one who came victorious over death, hell, and the grave. We're not fighting for victory. We're really battling from victory. Jesus has already won, I call it, the crown. So there's a privilege to suffer and reign with Christ. That's part of my story. Another part of my story is the privilege to pray and petition our Lord. Part of my story, is it yours? You can probably think back on some prayers that you have prayed for somebody else. And you could probably say, hey man, I was right on target with that. But you probably can also think of multiple times when you prayed for something and you can say, with me today, I was way off target with that one. Why? Because we know not what to pray for as we ought. But thank God the Spirit maketh intercession for us with what? Groanings which cannot be uttered. So the privilege to know and go with the Lord, verse 27 said, He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God, or to the will of our Lord. Hey, isn't that exciting? He makes intercession for us. You know, the Lord Jesus made intercession for us, did He? Yes, Jesus carried His sinless blood to the Father. You know what the Scripture said, it pleased the Lord to bruise Him. So now we're seeing in verse 27, it says the Spirit makes intercession for us. God the Son made intercession for us. God the Spirit makes intercession for us, and it's according to the will of God. I've got some words there, our steps and our stops and our stands and our story. So what makes up our story? What makes up my story? It starts with my steps, doesn't it? How many of you had to learn to walk? Some of you were just born with it, wasn't you? No, we all had to learn. I remember this little boy that uh, was much younger than me, went to the church I grew up in outside of Patterson. He had two older siblings. And after about a year and a half, the mom and dad got to thinking, this fellow ain't going to never walk. This little boy ain't going to never walk. I almost remember my dad telling him, well, he don't have to walk. Y'all toting him everywhere. Well, my spiritual journey, my spiritual life, my story started with my steps. You know, when you are new in Christ, that walk with Christ, sometimes it's what we call baby steps, isn't it? Aren't you glad? The Lord didn't tell us to run. He told us to take those steps. The psalmist said the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Aren't you glad He guides our steps? Yeah, man, I am. I'm glad that he hadn't gave up on guiding or giving my steps either. Some of you, honestly, I'm looking in your eyes today. There's very few of you, and I'd have to really think on this one, that I would have known 22 years ago when I came to Waycross. I'm really stretching that now. I know some of you uh, are thinking, boy, you didn't know me 22 years ago. I don't know that there's a one in the room. Whit Dixon, he's the one. 
Whit came up to Bristol one night when I was pastoring up there in the 80s. And uh, his daughter at that time lived up there, matter of fact. Am I right? And uh, he's the only one that I would have known. I'd heard of Clint Bowman, how, how, how great and glorious he was. And somebody always told me that Harriet was the cream of that crop, you know. And I've learned to believe all of that. I remember that. But I never saw him, never met him. You know what? God crosses our steps. I can honestly say I'm excited that because you were following the steps of the Lord and I followed the steps of the Lord, that you know who we are today? We're family. You know, God orders our stops as well. If we're always stepping, and if we're always moving, sometimes we miss the greatest of blessings because the Lord would have us stand still once in a while. How many of you remember that passage, Be still and know that I'm God? Yeah. Now, when you be still a little while, that don't mean stay still. You know, most of us were not taught to be still. We were taught, don't stand there. Don't just stand there. Do something. But God wants us to stand there sometimes because that's where He has ordained that we'll maybe do some of the work or we'll learn to wait. Our stands. There was this old saying in Bible college, we'll make sure that hill's worth dying on. Make sure that hill's worth dying for. Well, when the Lord tells you to take a stand, take a stand. And as a result of that, what we've written is over that period of time, we've written our story. Now, I know some of you are good at this because I've sat around with you before and you've told me a lot of your story. You know what Paul was writing in Romans chapter 8? His story. And he actually was writing my story. And he concluded it with verse 28. When he said, And all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to His purpose. Not some of the things will work together for good. A few of the things will work together for good. No. All things work together for good to them that love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. Some of you have followed that little old fancy quote on Facebook or somewhere that the old guy says, well, I don't like lemons. And you know, and somebody else are maybe right, and I don't like something else. Well, most of things in life, individually as it stands alone, we have not enjoyed it. It's been rough. But if we take it in the larger picture and allow ourselves to see what God is doing through it all, what we see is this. All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. Take the worst thing that's ever happened to you, if you will. See it through the eyes of God. And let God work out the best. And you see how God has been at work in your story. Let's pray together. As we pray, remember, hey, life, life never was promised to be easy. But God was shown to be good. And as we pray this morning, just remember that God hasn't surrendered His throne or authority to any man or anybody. Keep Him on the throne of your life. Lord, what a pleasure just to be able to approach your throne again. Lord, help me continue to write the story. Lord, not just that I have peace with God, not just that I'm willing to suffer for God and with God, but also that you're working out all things for good because of that love we have. Lord, stir the hearts of your people today. Draw us all ever so close to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. As you are here today and you'll remain seated, Brother Taylor will lead us in a song of invitation and commitment. Hey, is God speaking to your heart? Commitments need to be made. Would you so be faithful today as we sing? All to Jesus.
Savior, I surrender. 